Hello everyone and welcome to Paul's Hardware. Today I'm going to be doing a bit of tech news. Nvidia has a brand new GPU, but don't get too excited because they have resurrected a 14 nanometer Pascal chip and dubbed it the GT1010. Intel's newly announced Rocket Lake CPUs are expected later in Q1, but prices have already been posted at multiple retail websites. And I will be going over the best mini ITX AMD B550 motherboards in 2021, according to our friends over at Hardware Unboxed. Let's get started. Excellent. If you need next-gen storage, the ADATA XPG Gamex S70 is an SSD that actually uses PCIe Gen 4 bandwidth, hitting read speeds up to 7400 megabytes per second and write speeds up to 6400 megabytes per second. It's an M.2 SSD equipped with XPG's proprietary aluminum heat spreader designed for increased surface area and airflow. The S70 comes in capacities up to 2 terabytes, supports NVMe 1.4, and features dynamic SLC caching with a DRAM cache buffer. It's backed by a 5-year warranty too, so click the sponsor link in the description for more. So if you need a new graphics card right now, you are in a pretty dire situation to be frank. And in fact, as I'll be talking about a little bit later on, there is a global shortage of semiconductors, which is not helping the situation at all. Hope is not entirely lost though. Enter the newly discovered NVIDIA GT 1010 as uh, discussed over here on the TechSpot article and all the articles I'm talking about today are linked in the description, by the way. Now, this was actually unearthed by a YouTuber named Daps and his friend from Discord after they spotted the uh, previously unknown GeForce GT 1010 in the uh, list of the supported GPUs on the NVIDIA driver page. Now specs wise, this new GPU is going to be based on the five year old 14 nanometer Pascal GPU architecture with the GP108 GPU, which is the same one from the GT 1030, which has been out for some time now, but it has been cut down to have even fewer CUDA cores, 256 for the 1010 versus 384 on the 1030. You also get two gigabytes of GDDR5 memory on a 64 bit bus for 41 1.1 gigabytes per second of available bandwidth and a 30 watt TDP, meaning you can get away with as little as a 200 watt power supply. I think there are three things that make this a little bit more interesting than your typical entry level GPU launch, which I typically don't even bother discussing at all. First, it was discovered in a weird sort of way. Normally we'd expect some type of announcement from Nvidia about a new GPU SKU, but this could mean it's an OEM only part for system integrators that won't actually be available for retail sale for normal people to buy like you and me. That said, if it is available for customers, it probably isn't going to be worth more than about $50 or so. Second, with the stock situation for CPUs and graphics, graphics cards being what it is right now, I'm guessing that there might be a little bit more interest in inexpensive GPUs that could be used as a holdover until there's wider availability of higher end models. Even entry level stuff can be very hard to obtain right now, so the GT1010 could provide a stopover solution for anyone who is building uh, a new AMD system with one of the many Ryzen CPUs that does not have integrated graphics. A benefit specifically for the GT1010 as well is the default display out configuration, which tech power up lists as two DV and a single mini HDMI versus the single DVI and single HDMI shown on the GT1030, so you can power three displays rather than just two. It is also a single slot card and it doesn't require additional power connectors from the power supply. That might make it an interesting choice for the third thing I was gonna talk about, which is actual practical use as an HTPC graphics card. Just remember that the Pascal GP108 chip does not have NVIDIA's NVENC encoder solution built in, which could be a deal breaker for many. Intel finally announced and confirmed their Rocket Lake CPUs at CES just last week, which are expected to launch towards the end of Q1 2021. This should be Intel's last raw on the 14 nanometer node, and these chips will slot into existing socket LGA 1200 motherboards. Uh, those currently have the 400 series chipset, and we'll also be seeing the launch of a new lineup of 500 series motherboards too. Incidentally, I have heard that the motherboards will be available well in advance of the CPUs themselves, but thanks to this article from Video Cards, we can at least get maybe a rough estimate of what the prices will be. These are sourced from a tweet and it's videocards.com, so take this with the usual grain of salt, but Belgian retailer to compute as well as a handful of other retailers like LAFI from Saudi Arabia, Buy It Direct and Axitech from the UK, and SBM, which apparently is located here in the US, have listed the new CPUs along with pricing. Intel's advances with their 11th gen core CPUs, which include IPC gains from updated Cypress Cove microarchitecture, PCIe 4.0 support and additional PCIe lanes directly from the CPU might be overshadowed by the flagship 11900K's reduced core count going to uh, eight cores 
instead of the 10 cores that you got with the 10900K, but hopefully we'll find out soon when performance reviews actually drop. When it comes to prices, however, I feel like this leaked info is just pretty muddy. I have no doubt that retailers are creating product pages to sell these new CPUs, but pre-launch prices are often placeholders, and I don't recommend relying on them. Just look for example from these two lists that were tweeted out. Uh, the 11th gen stuff is on the left and the 10th gen stuff is on the right. Depending on the retailer that you're looking at for like an 11900K, for example, uh, is it cheaper than the 10900K going from 550 euro down to 500? Is it more expensive going from 505 up to about 545? It just varies depending on which of the prices on these lists that you look look at. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, which really muddies, I think, my experience looking at these leaked numbers. My skepticism abounds, but uh, if you guys are interested in looking a little bit more detailed at some of these numbers, again, the article is linked in the video description, and you can check it out, but uh, in my opinion, we should hold out for better info. Now, if you guys didn't notice, I am trying out a little bit of a new format for uh, some weekly tech news. Uh, if everyone likes it, then I will continue to make videos like this, so let me know your feedback in the comment section below. But one thing I want to do each week is highlight a well-done review video from another tech channel. This week we have a Mini ITX B550 motherboard roundup from our friend Steve over at Hardware Unboxed. He had four models that he tested, and as usual Steve did a great job with very thorough testing of the four boards covered from Asus, Gigabyte, MSI, and ASRock. The full video is linked in this video's description, so I highly encourage you guys to check it out. But here is my summary. The ASRock B550M ITX AC performed the worst out of all the boards, but is still a good budget option as long as you're going with a Ryzen 5 or a Ryzen 7 processor. It can also handle a Ryzen 9 like a 3900X or 3950X, but it will suffer from high VRM temperatures in heavy workload situations and it throttled during 3950X overclocking. The Gigabyte Aorus B550i Aorus Pro AX, the Asus ROG Strix B550-i Gaming, and the MSI MPG B550i Gaming Edge Wi-Fi all performed very well with temps within a few degrees of each other. Here's a look, for example, at Steve's testing with the 3900X, although he did also test a 3700X and a 3800X, and you can see that the MSI board did run just a little bit cooler, but they're all within a decent range of each other if you don't include the ASRock. Steve's pick was the Gigabyte Aorus Pro AX because it costs a bit less at around $180. It has passive cooling via a beefy VRM heatsink, and it comes with a backplate and a fixed IO shield. Uh, I actually did a build with this board for my friend Chad, at the end of 2020, and uh, I really liked it too, although it does lack a front panel USB Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 header, so if your case sports one of those, then the MSI or ASUS board might be a better choice for you. Great job on that review video though, Steve. Everyone go subscribe to Hardware Unboxed if you're not already. I highly recommend their channel. And uh, secondary shout out to Optimum Tech, who I believe Steve referenced in his video. And if you guys like uh, small form factor builds, Optimum Tech is a great solution for that. That does it for my regular stories. Uh, now I'm gonna wrap things up with some short bits of tech news. Nvidia has officially updated the required specs that a gaming monitor must meet to qualify for G-Sync Ultra ultimate certification, and they've actually Reduce them. Uh, that pesky 1000 nits of brightness that's required for HDR1000 support has proven to be difficult to achieve in monitors that don't cost more than your house. And after CES announcements came through for monitors like the MSI MEG381 CQR and the LG 34GP950G, which only meet HDR600 specs, but are still G-Sync Ultimate certified, NVIDIA simply changed the requirement on the spec page from uh, including HDR over 1000 nits of brightness to a more loosely defined including lifelike HDR. So uh, I guess by lifelike, they mean HDR600. Meanwhile, TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, is on track with their three nanometer fabrication technology, which should be online later this year. So few of us have even been able to play with seven nanometer silicon that it's crazy to think TSMC is talking about the change from five nanometer down to three. A larger change than from seven nanometers to five, they say, but one that will result in up to 70% density increase for components, a 15% boost in performance, and 30% power reduction. They've already spent 25 to 28 billion US dollars developing three nanometer. They are building a plant in Arizona in the US that will spin up in 2024 to help with supply chain issues and international tariffs, although that won't be online in time to start rolling out three nanometer stuff until 2024. But also according to the article from PC Perspective, by the way, competitor Samsung will also be starting three nanometer production later this year with other competitor Intel talking about 2025. I guess Intel's still running a little bit behind. 
Finally, it's not just GPUs that are overpriced and in short supply right now. Uh, there is actually a global shortage of semiconductors that is also affecting automotive manufacturing. The latest victim is Ford, who has ordered a month-long production halt at one of its plants in Germany until February 19th. This is also affected by weak demand for autos in general, as travel continues to be impacted by the global pandemic. But according to CNN, semiconductor manufacturers reassigned capacity from automakers last year after the pandemic slashed car sales, instead shipping chips to companies that produce smartphones, gaming systems, and other tech gadgets that remain in high demand. The average car uses 50 to 150 chips to power things like driver assistance systems and navigation controls, and Volkswagen, Fiat, Chrysler, Toyota, Nissan, and Honda are all suffering from this shortage. But there you have it guys, some tech news to start off your week, and since this is a little bit of a different and new format, I am very interested to hear what you guys think of it. For right now, I am planning to do this once a week, or until I hear that you guys hate it or something like that, but of course your feedback is always welcome, so please feel free to leave me a comment in the comment section down below. While you're down there, all of the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. Uh, you can also click the like button on this video if you enjoyed it. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merch options, shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and that sort of thing. And subscribe to my YouTube channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again everyone for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.